Welcome to e-cigarette smoking and bladder cancer. This is a patient insight webinar from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. We'd like to thank our patient insight webinar sponsors, the Estella Seattle Genetics Partnership, Bristol Myers Squibb, EMD Serono Pfizer Partnership, Fairgene Janssen, Genentech, Merck, and PhotoCure for their support. Every year, over 80,000 people will learn that they have bladder cancer. Of those, about 50% can be attributed to smoking and tobacco use. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Research at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. I'm joined today by Dr. Richard Petulowitz from NYU Langone Health and Dr. Mark Berlin from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, be here today to uh, discuss this important topic. Uh, and with that said, I think it's uh, it's important to really understand uh, the landscape, not only of bladder cancer, but also of uh, how smoking relates to bladder cancer before we really start to do a deep dive uh, into the rest. So bladder cancer in the United States uh, is diagnosed in about 80,000 cases per year, 80,000 patients per year. And unfortunately, this results in about 20,000 deaths per year, specifically due to bladder cancer. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, there is a male to female predominance, about a three to four times uh, the increased risk of being diagnosed with bladder cancer uh, between uh, males and females. Um, and and uh, throughout the world, um, this incidence and this prevalence translates into about 1.5 to 2 million uh, bladder cancer survivors um, after diagnosis, um, which, which really gives us the understanding of just how uh, important a topic this is for, for the 2 million people who have had bladder cancer, um, that uh, some of which may be uh, smokers previously. So what we do know also is that smoking causes bladder cancer, and about 50% of all cases of bladder cancer can actually be directly attributable to cigarette smoking. Um, and looking here at the odds of uh, patients who are former smokers compared to never smokers and current smokers compared to never smokers, what you can see is that a current smoker has a four times greater odds of being diagnosed with bladder cancer than a never smoker. And even a former smoker, uh, regardless of when quit, has about a two times greater odds of being diagnosed with bladder cancer than uh, a never smoker. And these uh, persist uh, within male and female genders. What we also know is that smoking intensity is related to bladder cancer risk. So the longer and the more number of pack years that someone smokes, the higher their cancer risk has is. Um, additionally, one of the things that we discovered in recent years, which has been nicely demonstrated um, in, in epidemiologic studies, is that risk is actually increasing for current smokers. And although cigarettes have changed over the years, uh, there is some thought that some of the way the tobacco uh, is packaged and treated now actually portends a greater risk in the more modern era of cigarettes than past. So this is not only a problem that, it, that is quite prevalent, it actually may be getting worse. So taking a step back um, and talking about prevention strategies in, in medicine, you have really three different means of prevention. Uh, the first being primary prevention, as you can see here, this is really trying to prevent the onset of disease. So this would be uh, a lot of the things that have uh, been done at the population level, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, public policy changes that have uh, reduced the number of smokers. Um, and this actually is something that, uh, you know, the goal is to prevent the, di the, the onset, the, the, uh, someone getting bladder cancer. Um, and this is something, again, that's done by the government, is done at the population level, um, whereas these tertiary and secondary preventions, this is really more the space that urologists and patients uh, need to partner together to, to address. And this is uh, secondary prevention here is basically after the onset of disease or after diagnosis, um, this is stopping the, uh, the agent, in this case, cigarette smoking, that can actually lead to worse outcomes. Uh, before uh, disease develops and, and progresses. Uh, similar with tertiary prevention, this is once uh, disease has, has uh, started to show symptoms. So these are really where the urologist and the patient can partner to, to prevent worse outcomes down the road. 
So the good news in all of this is that smoking actually is becoming less prevalent. And we know from the time of the first uh, report of the Surgeon General uh, for smoking cessation back in 1965, which is really the marker uh, in the sand as to when the public really uh, was told that smoking causes cancer. As you can see here in, in the subsequent almost 60 years, um, there have been some declines in the amount of patients who are currently smoking at every, any given time in the United States. Uh, and this has definitely uh, been very, very impactful um, in reducing the amount of uh, tobacco-related disease uh, in the United States. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of the trends we are seeing also, uh, although uh, cigarette smoking is decreasing, e-tobacco use and e-tobacco products like vapes um, and, and jewel pens have actually increased uh, in prevalence. And, and most importantly, and most concerningly, actually, uh, these trends are increasing among youth, which are uh, at very high risk for subsequent uh, tobacco-related illness, given the fact that they are starting uh, tobacco use very early and have many, many years down the road of, of continuing if it persists. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Berlin now to give a nice um, explanation uh, as to what really uh, relates to uh, the bladder cancer risk in cigarette and e-cigarette. All right, next we'll transition into discussing the topics of cigarettes and e-cigarettes and why they actually may place smokers at risk for developing bladder cancer. So to get kind of a 30,000 foot overview of electronic cigarettes, and that e-cigarettes came on the U.S. market somewhere around 2007 and really have exploded. They are now over a $10 billion in industry and their use has really become a public health crisis with an exponential rise over the last three to five years. E-cigarettes are considered an alternative to conventional cigarettes for a number of reasons one being their appealing appearance, number two being their taste, and the third is perhaps their actual use characteristics, which make them popular among many age groups, particularly adolescents and young adults. However, the, definity, the definitive safety profile of e-cigarettes has really not been fully characterized. And given this large and increasing use in e-cigarettes, there's a pressing need to understand the health implications of vaping. So to have a general idea of how electronic cigarettes work, we can see here that they do have four main elements to them. One is the cartridge or reservoir, and this is part of the e-cigarette that holds the, what's called e-liquid or e-juice that has the nicotine in it. There's the heating element that will heat this juice, and then also there's a battery, a lithium ion battery, similar to your Tesla car or your uh, electronic lawnmower that will again heat this uh, device. And then lastly, there's the mouthpiece that's used to actually inhale the aerosol from the electronic cigarette. So this slide shows some pictures of e-cigarettes on the left and a specific brand of e-cigarette called Jules on the right, which really highlights some of the design variability among these devices. So seen on the far left here is a conventional cigarette and the earlier e-cigarettes, the first generations, had a very similar shape and size similar to conventional e-cigarette. You can see them on the second, third, and fourth from the left. The second generation e-cigarettes here shown on the fifth and sixth from the left had these clear reservoirs that were filled with the e-liquid and these were conventionally known as vape pens. The third generation e-cigarettes shown on this far right here have the ability to modify the wattage and the voltage and thus are known as mods. And then when someone uses an e-cigarette, it's colloquially known as vaping. 
On the right here is the actual brand of e-cigarette called Juul. And these have recently received a number of uh, significant media attention because of their rapid uptake in adolescence. Part of the appeal of these Juul devices is their small, sleek shape that you can see here uh, and their ability to use these devices surreptitiously in that they can often you know, hide them from the teachers when the adolescents use them. The Juul device looks actually like a USB flash drive and actually can be plugged into a USB port in order to recharge it. The device does have some pre-filled cartridges shown here. These are referred to as pods, and each one of these contains just less than one milliliter of unique solution uh, that's referred to the e-juice or the e-liquid. And then each of these individual pods is marketed to be equivalent to one pack of cigarette in terms of puffs. So an average pack of cigarettes, a user gets about 200 puffs, an average pod of a, a Juul device has about 200 puffs. And then commonly when someone uses a Juul device, it's referred to as Juuling rather than vaping, which is commonly used for electronic cigarettes. And that's slide 10, 11, and 12. Yeah, I think we need to just do one more. Oh, do 13. Yep, sorry, I thought I had the numbers uh, down, but just, I think we okay. need number 13. So if I no can problem. cut my comments out, so that'll be fine. And um, let me just, I'm gonna just go back for one second. Mm -hmm. I just wanna turn my, my uh, microphone off. So I'm just gonna flip it back. When I get it back there, you can do slide 13. This is the slide where it picked up. So e-cigarette solutions, often referred to as either e-juice or e-liquid, are actually even more diverse than the devices themselves. The solutions commonly are advertised to contain three different types of chemicals, one being a humectant, the second being nicotine, and the third being a variety of flavors. The two humectants that are most commonly used are either one propylene glycol or number two vegetable glycerin. These are additives that are used to reduce moisture loss. And both of these solutions are generally recognized as safe for ingestion, but to date there's really little evidence about their safety profile for long-term inhalation. The majority of e-cigarette solutions are advertised to contain nicotine, and this may ref, uh, actually range from no nicotine at all to up than more than 24 milligrams per milliliter of solution of nicotine. And the level of nicotine actually has been reported to vary quite substantially uh, from what is actually advertised that's in the liquid to what is actually in the liquid when it's tested. Uh, by an analytical chemistry assay. Most brands of electronic cigarette solutions are available in a variety of flavors, and these range from uh, fruits, desserts, candies, sodas, to traditional tobacco flavor. Menthol is actually a common compound found in both mint and tobacco flavored e-cigarettes. And there's also some coffee and chocolate flavored e-cigarettes that actually have 42% or 52% uh, levels of caffeine in some of these. You can see on the right side of the slide that these e-liquids are marketed quite similar to actual uh, um, food sources that uh, adolescents may use. You can see here that the food product shown on the right is in uh, apple juice and there's a juice box of apple flavored e-liquid. On the bottom, you can see the Sour Patch Kids as a sour flavor, and then e-liquid uh, also as a candy flavored sour uh, flavor that you can add to the, to the e-liquid or e-juice. So there are quite a variety of uh, devices and even more so e-liquids or e-juices. 